So what we're going to talk about is what is standing, what, what do we define it as right now, clinical interventions, why is standing important clinically. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about system mechanics of standing. Um, and then we're going to redefine standing a little bit, rethink what it is and how to work with it. And then talk a little bit about future clinical interventions and how we might help people that have standing issues. Standing isn't just standing. So why do we stand? Sometimes somebody says, hey, stand up. Um, sometimes you stand on the line. Sometimes you stand and chat with a colleague after a workshop. Um, dancers stand. Basically, between every dance movement is standing. So underlying all dance is standing, um, walking through a field. And yes, just before you get ready to walk anywhere, you stand. So we have standing as a clinical measurement. Uh, many researchers measure quiet standing, which isn't really quiet. You have a platform that you measure the sway and, and measure against postural perturbations and what happens. And also the Romberg test is a still standing test that's used for neurological diagnostics. So you stand quietly with your eyes closed, neurologist pushes on you, and depending on how you respond to that balancing and that standing, they can derive what neurological conditions you may have. So what happens if you have a standing impairment? Um, you can have, or how do you get a standing impairment, really? You can have an injury to your pelvis, to your spine, to your foot, your ankle, your knee, a neurological injury, or developmental injuries and delays, cerebral palsy, um, Down syndrome, autism, all movement disorders, impair standing. And right now, these are all in children, so clinical interventions of, of a child that's non-ambulatory. We know that standing is important, and we'll talk about why in just a minute, but this is what we do. We have standards, and there are three major types of standards. We have the supine standard. You lay it backwards and lay the child flat into it, strap them in at various key points, and then stand them up to some measure of degrees between 0 and 90. And over here, we have the prone standard. You do the same thing except you lay them on their bellies and then stand them up to some level. And finally, we have the sit to stand standard, which does it in multiple ways, but you can do sitting and standing. And we do that because weight bearing is important. Um, weight bearing helps prevent hip dysplasia, helps do um, hip development. But the problem with our standards right now is that our weight-bearing loads range from 37 to 101 percent, depending on where they are in the range of motion, how you put them in the standard each day. And in this study, they noted that putting the same person into the same standard during their interventions identically was nearly impossible. So with changes in spasticity and tone, you, you can't get the same load bear each day. So is there a way that we can really address that and help without having to do something that's not identical every day, but actually does something help, helpful? So benefits of standing therapy. These things all happen when you're standing. So you get better expansion of the lungs, and that massages your heart better. You have peristaltic action of the digestive system is improved. Um, obviously, weight bearing improves your bone density better elimination, and better digestion. So these, in addition to just helping the hip joints, are all reasons to stand. And if you get to stand and you walk every day, the more you do it, the better off you are health-wise. But folks that have some standing impairment or are non-ambulatory lack these things. So we want to find ways to do this in addition to helping them function. So. This is how development happens, or how standing occurs, and we're not going to go through each of these steps of the development of standing and walking, but you can see various stages in development of, of the creation of standing. And that happens through the process of system mechanics. So the first thing that happens is you have a sensory or environmental input. And it might be mom as they're breastfeeding, or the floor as they're looking, or the object going by that they can see for the first time and they start to turn. So that uh, stimulus creates a movement. And when they move, the next thing they have to do is create a balance and a counterbalance within the system to not fall over. And it's a learned thing. So they do the prop sitting to look. Or when they go to all fours, they have the four and then they start to rock. Um, so you have your development of balance and counterbalance. 
Another key development to movement is the opposition of gravity. So if you can't oppose gravity, you can't move, you can't do anything. Um, and when we start to succumb to gravity, we start losing our gait, we start losing our ability to walk, we start aging poorly, or the process of dying really kind of starts when you cease to oppose gravity. So opposition of gravity and development is key. And then after you go through those steps, you kind of refine that movement and get a new vocabulary of, of movement, a new piece, a new word of movement. Um, so now I can move my arm this way, or now I can prop right here and know how to do this. So the next time you get an environmental stimulus, you can refine that and do something to, oh, now I can reach over here this way, or now I can, I can do it over here too and do this way. So you get to refine that and increase the complexity of your movement vocabulary. So all movement requires rotation. And if you watch this little boy, there is rotation in every joint, the pelvis, the knees, the hands, the eyes, there's articulation in the spine. Everything requires rotation to move. So if you don't have rotation, you are not going to move. And you're not gonna oppose gravity without rotation. So when we've been figuring out movement and how to calculate movement, what to do, and let's say a simple, a simple thing like kicking a ball, we usually think of this. We wanna know the acceleration of the leg, it's the change in velocity over the change of, over time. That seems pretty easy. But we're failing to account for rotation. So when you add rotation, you have to do angular velocities. <laughs> and when you have angular velocities, then you introduce torque. Um, so now you have to account for torque, inertia, angular velocities. It gets more complex, but you're actually accounting for all that and it moves because when you kick your leg, your femur rotates, your knee rotates, your fibia tibula both rotate, your ankle, your tarsals, your metatarsals, the whole thing, all of them have rotation, individual rotation. So if we're ignoring all of that, we're not actually accounting for movement. So any intervention that we're doing, like standing or standers, we're not accounting for the rotation in those joints and we're not allowing the sway of the movement that we need. Because nobody actually stands completely still, there's always a sway. But when we lock them in, you, you can't sway. So what do we actually think standing is? So previously most people think standing occurs from the feet up. Obviously the pelvis is involved, but really standing starts at the pelvis. So during development, um, the, the developmental milestone that we consider tummy time is actually the pubic bone strike. So it's where the pubic bone strikes the ground and then that's what actually lifts the head in opposition as opposed to it being a muscle load lift system of the head and neck. So it's, it's the opposition to gravity and counterbalancing through the system. So that's the same thing when you stand. Your pubic bone actually pushes towards the floor. And then we have Newton's third law, so every action has an equal and opposite reaction. And this is your customary, I'm standing so the floor is pushing up on me the exact same amount I'm pushing on the floor. But if you rethink it from the pelvis, you actually have this, I'm pushing down on the floor, this applied force through the floor in response to gravity, and then all of this is in opposition to gravity. And so now you have a neutral system, if you're calculating this way, you have a neutral system that can go in any direction. I can go this way, I can go this way. I'm not stuck down at my ankles, and then it gives you more freedom to move, and it's really how standing happens, and where we need to look at starting standing is from the pelvis. And so you think that breathing is no big deal, but then watch all of the rotation that you have to counterbalance when you're breathing and standing. So the ribs expand in opposition to the expansion of the lungs. They go up and the lungs come down. The pelvis, you can just look right in here. Look at this rotation just from breathing and the articulation in each of these vertebrae. And it's gonna swing around to the back and you'll see that even more clearly. But this is all movement that's happening when you're standing and breathing. And you have to counterbalance all of this movement to stand. So if we're not accounting for that, then we're not actually doing justice to the system because we're actually asking it to do something static and it's doing several things at the same time that are not static processes at all. Standing is actually a movement. <coughs> so here you can see that it's really subtle. The shoulder even rotates through the scapula. But again, all of this movement in the spine that's not necessarily appreciated 
from just standing and breathing. And it, it really makes you think about what standing is and, and the Parkinson's folks succumbing to gravity or Alzheimer's patients succumbing to gravity, aging as in and of itself. The, the change in osteoporosis as they start to bend over and lose this articulation in the spine. Um, so we're losing standing, and then we're losing breathing, and then we're losing all of those benefits from standing. So we need to work on clinical interventions to improve standing and help both the children, which is where my focus is, all the way through our aging adults. So we have to counterbalance breathing and other endogenous things. We have, to, we have to accommodate our sweating that we have just by nature. So if I'm swaying this way, my body has to help me come this way, because if I go same, same, I'm going to fall over. So all the time, we're counterbalancing those things. And then everybody has some little glitch in their system. Some things happen to all of us, and there's some little spot that we don't rotate as well as we should, or it's just not as free, or I'm walking through a conference with a 25-pound bag, and I'm just standing here, and so I've got 20 pounds on this side, and I've got a counter at it just to stand here and do this. So you have things to work around all the time. So these are the three things that we really have to incorporate um, just, just to create standing and every other movement. Um, so we come over the system, we have Newton's third law, we counterbalance our endogenous stimuli, sometimes external stimuli as well. So what can we do? How can we shift our clinical paradigms? What can we do to help standing in a different way? Because obviously strapping them in a passive stander isn't going to work, even with our adults, our paraplegics. It, it, it's a static thing. So through the use of uh, mechanism with gentle touch, you can join with the system, and then you can create a movement, and you can tell in this case, you can, this, this person is able to be told, you can tell them to use different things, and as the, the video goes, you'll see, telling them to use different muscles to feel what it's like, to lean forward and oppose gravity in one way or the other way, I'm not running video, to sit down, to stand up, all things that you, you can do, and if you have somebody who can't do these things, you can create the, the position behind them. So with a child that has cerebral palsy, you can sit behind them and create these rotations and teach take them the, through those steps. And then with, with aging, you're really kind of going backwards through the developmental processes to create those experiences again, remind the system how to do those things and work around the glitches that you may have developed along the way. Again, using different muscles and different ways to go. different places so you can see like again standing starts in pelvis and comes through it well I thought I was there we're just gonna stand again these times <laughs> I'm out there we go we're standing again um, so we have those again those interventions that you can do both with somebody who is ambulatory and cognitive and able to do but you can still do it with children who have difficulties. And are we to the hands now? I think it's looping. Oh, it's looping? Yeah. I'm not going to keep, keep letting it loop. And I'll make up some time for everybody. <laughs> 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 Thank you.